Lord move in a mighty way, ought only to encourage us to live for him today. And Peter's not going to live the rest of his life telling the story about how one day he was in prison and he was released. He's going to spend the rest of his life preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what he begins to do immediately after this wonderful miracle. I fear if God were to do a miracle in our life, we'd just spend the rest of our lives talking about it. And too often we mention our own name instead of the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We must be reminded of that if we are to see God answer prayer in a wonderful way, we're going to have to ask Him specifically to do things that are far beyond man's ability. And secondly, we're going to have to give Him the glory He deserves when He does it. Peter's not going to spend the night rejoicing that his life was spared. What difference does it make that his life was spared? And I don't mean to be flippant about the value of a life. Your life is so precious to the Lord that Christ died on the cross for you. God loves you very much. That's where you ought to find your value. But Peter didn't live his whole life trying to spare it. Peter said, I just want to be spent for Christ. I just want to live for the Lord. You know, too many of us spend our time and our days trying to protect this life that we live when instead we ought to spend our lives trying to serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. It's not all about this life, friend. It's about eternal life. And we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. It's the greatest answer to prayer. And that's what we ought to live based upon. And so that's what Peter is going to declare. And so consequently now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become, become of Peter. And so uh, they were a little confused about it, to put things mildly. I think that's another major understatement. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea, and their abode. And so Herod murdered the soldiers instead of murdering uh, Peter. And uh, it brought glory to God to do it that way. Now, let's just deal with Herod very quickly and we'll be finished this evening. Now, Herod was displeased, highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. So here is Tyre and Sidon, and obviously somehow their country is supported by Herod's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. So Herod got up and he made a speech to these people of Tyre and Sidon who think he's big stuff. And the people gave a shout saying, It's the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. And God got the glory. Here's an individual that for his own glory is willing to put the servants of the Most High God to death. And God was able to spare them, and he did so in the case of the life of Peter. And this same individual, rather than fear God, who was able to release Peter from prison in a way that was inexplicable, puffs himself up and blames some soldiers and puts them to death. And then he goes a step further in his pride, and I believe it's the mercy of God that he survived this long. He goes a step further in his pride and he receives an oration where individuals look to him and say, hey, he's God. And God said, well, that's enough, Herod. And he snuffed out his life. Now, let me just ask you a question. Could not God have put Herod to death when he messed with James? I mean, could, when, when Herod gives a decree that James is to be put to death, couldn't God say, how about some worms and, and I'll take his breath from him? He certainly could have. Based on what we've looked at this evening, why did God not do that? God wasn't done. Okay, so because of His mercy. And that's true, isn't it? God's a merciful God. He's long-suffering. The Bible teaches the doctrine of long-suffering. That's described in 2 Peter chapter 3 as God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so God certainly has given Herod the opportunity for repentance here. Did Herod have a reason to believe in a powerful God in heaven? He sure did. He sure did. There's already a phenomenon happening that's taking over the world, and that is that people are being saved. And by the way, in the early church, it wasn't just people being saved. I'm telling you something. The things that were happening were impossible for a man. Why was it that when Peter and John were first taken early on by the high priests and by the chief priests and the scribes, why was it that they weren't put to death? The people or that the priest feared the people. the people. Why? Well, because they were popular. But what was the second fear that they had? What? Okay, they were afraid the people would turn on them. But I think there's something a little more to it than that. And what was that? 
Jesus, they killed Jesus and it didn't work. And if they killed Peter and John and that didn't work, they'd really have a mess on their hands. Because there was life. There was a resurrection. And these kind of things are happening. There's individuals being raised from the dead. There are folks that have been lame from birth that have been healed in the fullness of God's power. And I promise you that Herod knew about these things and he didn't care. And he took James and he put him to death. And he felt like he got away with it. And God spared Herod's life in the case of Peter. It would have been simple for God to have let them bring Peter out and God to have smote everyone involved in trying to put him to death and let Peter walk off that way. But God chose to take Peter in the night. Herod's response, kill the soldiers that had anything to do with it and take the glory that belonged to God. Believers, God was merciful to Herod, wasn't he? And when you pray and ask God to intervene, remember that God loves, he chooses to be long-suffering. He is a God who ultimately will judge and is right to do so. But he's a long-suffering God. And when you pray and ask God to intervene, do you pray for the individual that's responsible for the problem? Herod brought himself to a place when God had to deal with him. And that's when he put himself in the place of God. God, the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. The result, but the word of God grew and was multiplied. In closing this evening, I want to remind you of the one underlying theme that we've seen the whole way through the book of Acts and that is this. When God works and God moves, he'll get the glory. When God moves and he works, he'll get the glory. You know, many of us want to see God work in a great way and we want to see God use us in a great way and the reason he doesn't is because he couldn't have the glory, we'd take it. When God moves and God works, He gets the glory. And the second thing that happens when God moves and God works is that multitudes come to Him. People get saved. I want to remind you that the God that Peter and James and John Mark and these individuals that are mentioned here in the Scripture knew is the God who saved us. And He hasn't changed and His power is not diminished. And he's still in the process, he's still in the habit of saving lost souls. He saved us, and who'd have thunk it, right? I mean, who would have, who would have uh, nominated us as most likely to come to Christ before our salvation? If we're, if we're honest about it, probably we wouldn't have shared the gospel with us because we wouldn't have thought that we'd have listened. And yet God spoke to us, and, and he saved us. And he gets the glory for that, doesn't he? I want to remind you of one last thing, and that is that you can be used of God or you cannot be used of God. What will make the difference will be a number of things. One of those things will be whether or not you pray, whether or not you ask God to do things that only God could do so that He'd receive the glory by it. But I want to remind you as well that God always has truth. He's always had His church. And He's always saved souls. And he'll do so until the return of Christ. And he'll receive the glory for it. And you and I can be involved in that. And we can see God answer prayer in a mighty way. And we can see him use our lives in the way he chooses to do so. But he'll receive the glory. It might be that he might have to deal with us about some pride. Isn't it amazing how prideful we can be about asking God to do something and having him do it? I think that many times we don't see answer to prayer because we take credit for it. Yeah, you know, I spent four hours praying. I've, I've, I've heard some real bragging about prayer. Oh. Yeah, haven't you heard some prayer bragging? Yeah, well, they prayed all night long. I'll tell you, those people really know how to pray. Well, give them some glory then. Slap them on the back or something. Shame on you if you think like that. We pray because we need answer to prayer. We pray because we need God to intervene. And we ask God for power because we are powerless. And because He can and we cannot. And if you understand that, you'll know how to pray and He'll get the glory and God will do a mighty work. Heavenly Father, help us to give you the glory you deserve. Help us to pray because we're needy.
and because of the great God that you